We're here today, the GDG Cloud event at Campus London. We've had four amazing, inspiring speakers today talk about open source, machine learning, and AI. If you haven't been to an event or a hackathon before, you should definitely attend one of the most inclusive and diverse community events I've been to. Hopefully no one has fallen over and got bored of my talk, but thank you very much. We've been talking to GDG Cloud about having a hackathon because it would be great to get some coding. They do amazing workshops, but I'd love to just have two days of hardcore coding. I want to get to the YouTube space. I'm sure Jason and Florian can get me entrance into that. They apparently know everybody. They are some really cool dudes. And thank you for I have like four cameras on me, and I understand that cam each camera adds 10 pounds, so I must be like 50 pounds heavier with so many cameras on me. I feel like a movie star. Yeah! Um, I was saying, for those of you who don't know us, Datatonic is Google Cloud Email Service Partner of the Year, and we are a team of data scientists, machine learning experts, and so we do many projects on GCP, projects that require machine learning, big data. Again, I'm going to walk you through one of these. When you need to build a machine learning pipeline, you need to worry about a few things, because you need to worry about the model itself, its performance, you need to understand the use case, you need to think about your client's need, what do they know, do they have machine learning experts within or Google Cloud experts within. Let's just dive in the use case. So this is what we started with. We had these screenshots news websites. This is, for example, in the Tangent. And what a client wanted to do is they wanted to, from this image, be able of detecting all the articles, which we're going to call from now on stories from within this image. So every green box you see here is a box that the algorithm predicted with a copy that's core associated to it. And furthermore, uh, what they want to do is they want you to extract some more interesting information from it, which is take, for example, this article, extracting text, keywords, and uh, the sentiment of the article overall. The main task for them was to actually perform this object detection, so understanding these stories in the screenshot. And even though Google Cloud provides a solution for this in their Vision API, they were interested into a custom model that they could understand better and explain better. So that model is a cost, is custom model. And for the other components, we actually played around a little bit with the Google Cloud API, so we're going to see them a little bit. This is a Google Cloud Vision API to extract the text, and then the Google Cloud Language API to extract keywords and sentiment. First, let's look at the object detection model. It was the client's desire, and it's also what we would have recommended. We decided to use TensorFlow, and TensorFlow comes with a bunch of nice models within to perform some specific machine learning tasks. And in this case, we have an object detection API, which allows very straightforward to train models and serve models. This is the output of one of the many tutorials that are around. So it's detecting persons and types but you can really get up to whatever custom data set you have. Cool things about this API is that it's easy to install, it's got many tutorials online, so if you're not an expert, it's not that difficult to adopt. And this is also our client's uh, needs, because they didn't have any machine learning expertise within their team. Importantly, it allows very straightforwardly to perform transfer learning. So transfer learning is a machine learning technique that is typically used in computer vision where you start from a model that's already been trained on a data set. In our case, it's ImageNet data set, if you were to read. And the good thing about this is that the model has already learned on many iterations of training of many images to distinguish <coughs> features, which is eyes and any sort of other shape. So you can use this information that the model already learns and knows and just train the last layer of the, the network on your own specific data set. And this not only brings many, many times to a more accurate <coughs> model, but it also allows to trade much faster. Another cool thing is that it allows to perform some standard data processing, again, very straightforward. It can be normalization or g training the boxes and some other noises of some sort. And uh, it allows, <coughs> for those of you who know TensorFlow a bit, to have uh, different inputs for your model at certain time. So you can uh, give your image as an uh, image tensor as a test, for example, or as a string. And you can define all of these just by updating one config file. Because it's a huge package with a lot of code. <coughs> so really, if you need to do something a little more custom, it can be a little confusing and tiring to understand where things are. If you follow pretty much typical use cases that you really just need to update this config file, 
this is the money, all the model parameters is a little bit of things. All this part from here to here pretty much is just the network itself. So what you typically do is you decide what network to use after some research and then you find the config file that defines your network and update it to um, train on your own data set. So the things of interest pretty much this circle on top which defines how many classes you have, how many labels, in our case it was just one label, so is it a story? Yes, it is not a story. By position is just not a story. Did we use it for example, <coughs> image um, to add up to the network you're using for your train? So we defined the fixed height and width. Another thing you probably find yourself updating, even though maybe you're not a machine learning expert, is this part here, which are some training configurations. This is batch size, uh, which is the number of training examples you see interactively to learn your model parameters, and some model uh, requirements like optimizer learning rate. For example, in our case, um, by tuning the learning rate shadow was what really improved the performance of our models, so it's important to keep an eye on these parameters. And then, pretty much all of this final box you would need to update because um, this first slide here is very interesting because that's all you need to define to perform transfer learning. You just redirect to a checkpoint where you have your model that's been trained before, and then the code is going to automatically just start training from there. And here we define some data documentation steps. And finally, just where your data is lying, your training and your evaluation data. So this is really all you need to update to adapt to this use case. And this is the output of the model after it's trained. Um, it's quite interesting to look a little bit at it because we have three different uh, websites for news in the time that they may then be received. And what you can see, which is typical for object detection, is that the big boxes, the big stories, are very are much easier to detect. And uh, the small ones are sometimes <coughs> missed, and this is also the case here. A lot of little stories are missed, and this is because of the way you actually learn this model. You just learn the intersection of your prediction and the real boxes, so if you have at least a 50-70% overlap between the box you predict and the real box, it's a, real, it's a um, true prediction, and your model learns that this is a good prediction. <coughs> So, of course, this overlap is much smaller <coughs> if you have small stories, and small stories are more difficult to detect. Another good thing about this API is that this visualization actually comes from the API itself, and it's very good to understand how the model performs and explain it to stakeholders as well. A little one last detail about the model is that the model output is simply just a vector of numbers, which is a softmax vector of numbers which means um, that this number is a number between 0 and 1, and the higher this number is, the better your performance is. And this, uh, this one is representing how confident your algorithm is that this is my right table. So 100% confident, 90% confident, and so on. If you look at the, the times where the algorithm is very confident, we can see that the predicted boundary box is pretty much perfectly the original story. It's very well predicted. But if you look at this one, then you would see that there is the text that is entirely missing and some image is cropped out. And you don't really want to feed in full data, full data to the next stage, where you want to extract text, you want to extract uh, keywords and so on. So we decided uh, that it would probably be best to just feed in very confident uh, boundary boxes to the next stage and do some data analysis. Um, we figured out that the best <coughs> threshold in this case was 95% confident, because for each uh, web page we were taking a screenshot of, we would always have at least one story predicted correctly, so there was no information loss on general, generally talking. And while 99% threshold was, of course, even the best quality, but we had some instances where we didn't have any story for a news page, so it wasn't really worth it. Now that we know the machine learning model, we can look at how to actually serve this model for training and also for prediction. This is the architecture diagram of the solution Google Cloud Platform. As you can see, there is two very separate um, pipelines. There is a training pipeline that is automated with Composer. On a weekly schedule, what it does is that it takes training data stored on Google Cloud Storage. 
it converts these images to hair drivers, which is the best form activity to then use on the fast flow model. Then we use Google Cloud and Melangic to do the image preprocessing to train the model, and then also to serve the model if it has good enough performance. This leads us to the prediction pipeline where you have um, new images that keep arriving on Google Cloud Storage. So Cloud Function allows you to react on the trigger on this event. So every time there is a new image landing, what it does is that it sends a prediction request to Cloud Melangic. It gets the bounding boxes for that screenshot, so it recovers all the relevant stories out of it. And then it stores the inform this information on a BigQuery table. After this, for all those images that have at least 95% certainty, as we've seen before, we proceed with calling the, the Vision API to extract text and the language API to extract sentiment and keywords. We create a final BigQuery table with all this information and that the client can use for the next stage in their pipeline. And then we also store the, um, the stories, which are just cropped images from the original screenshot in another Google Cloud Storage platform. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through a little bit more in details with, about the two uh, Google Cloud components that are Composer and, and Cloud Functions, because they're very typically used in when you want to put an app model in production. And then we're also going to quickly look at the Cloud APIs Composer. I don't know how many of you had a chance to use it before. It's, it's actually very, very fun. Um, what it does, it allows you to perform orchestration. So you just need to define a, a Python script with a series of tasks. And each task is just an operator. And then out of these tasks, you define the dependencies between them. So you can then create a final task, which is just a graph. And this uh, graph performs this task in order so that you can actually communicate with any Google Cloud component. You can have a cloud storage operator, a query operator, you can send out an analytic job request, and so on. And uh, you have very easy monitoring. You can uh, also set it so that it sends an email if the pattern fails at any point. And the only bad thing is uh, most surprising, and if you were to have just this pipeline then we are looking at this at $300 a month because you're running on three containers. Uh, but typically, you have more than one pipeline because you are orchestrating more in the same machine learning pipeline and also orchestrating more within your uh, business. So it's actually ending up being a pretty cost efficient solution. So this is actually the graph for this uh, solution. It's activated on a weekly schedule every Monday at 11 a.m. These are operators, all of these. They are performed from right to left, to my right. Um, and this is an example of an operator which corresponds to the first task. This is a BigQuery operator, it's very simple syntax. You're just pretty much replicating what you would use when using GCloud or BQ commons. And you, you can perform parallel tasks, so you don't know, waste time. For example, you can move your training data in your models while serving your model on GCS so that your pattern runs as fast as possible. Then we have seen how the trade pipeline is orchestrated. We can look at the prediction pipeline. So this is the main difference, again, is that Y Composer allows you to define a schedule. Here you have a trigger, a trigger that can be based on events happening on storage, path sub, and more. Again, you just need to define a Python script or Node.js or Go script, and uh, you can perform any series of functionality if you want to. As long as it takes less than nine minutes to perform them. And it scales as much as required. You can send a thousand parallel requests to this cloud function. It's just going to create for you a thousand instances and then kill them once the functionalities are performed. It's very smart pricing because if the trigger never happens, you never pay for anything. It just stays there. This is the prediction pattern again for the solution. It happens every time you have a new screenshot on GCS. You have three main components. The first one, you send a request to an engine to predict your bounding boxes, your stories within your news page. And, uh, and this is just a log file so that you can see what's happening while you're building and that the bug is if anything goes wrong. Then you save this prediction into a temporary BigQuery table as we've discussed before. And you call the public APIs on very confident examples to get uh, text, sentiment, 
and other information. So this is the schema of the temporary table. You have an image name, the data process, these are the coordinates, the sensitive value of the algorithm used to filter to go to the next stage. And then you have the second output that looks like this. In red, you have information that is added to the Confusion API. So this is uh, um, the entry from this story, uh, from this story that's been predicted by the uh, ML model. Confusion API allows you for 5% in our case of our entries to actually be able to reconstruct the web article. It just performs a search, so it looks for that image on the internet, and if you find some imaginary website, it returns it to you. So in this case, it's capable of, of reconstructing the original BBC URL. And uh, this time, you can contain any image, just the Buddha value is extracting all the text from it. Of course, also, you write a lot of text, like independent minds up there, but that requires some processing afterwards. And then from it, you can call the language API that extracts keywords, which is pretty much all the adjective and nouns, really, in the text. And then you're capable of extracting a sentiment, this sentiment is uh, coming in two values. This is literally the sentiment, so if it's a negative value, it's negative. Around zero is neutral, positive, positive. And then there is a magnitude associated to it, which is a value between zero and infinity. And it's telling you how strongly that opinion is conveyed in the test. Finally, to conclude, uh, we can look a little bit at the cloud APIs. This is all the code that's required to extract all that amazing information from from our screenshots, and that's the cool thing because you don't really need to be a mad expert to be able to perform machine learning these days. Probably if you have some computer vision task or NLP task, you really want to use the Google Cloud APIs because the Google algorithms are the best ones. And, uh, and that's all the code you need to call the vision API, all the code you need to call the language API, plus some stream processing. That's all there is. This concludes pretty much the project and also my presentation to you. I won't take you over your attention. Hopefully we learned something new together and you can have some questions now or afterwards. Do we, do we have any questions? From the API that uh, you shared, it appears to me like uh, inferencing is done on the cloud. Is yeah. that um, is there a provision to be a client or uh, everything is just done on the cloud? The reason why I'm asking is because network latency can sometimes, you know, reduce the or increase the turnaround time. I but see. Well, that's this is not really a real time application, so there is no concerns about how fast you're giving this prediction. If you want to give it fast, probably there is a better way to build and this and to some more consideration including how big your model is, the bigger it is, and what time it will take to give your prediction, and so on. Overall, this is a, some sort of offline prediction, so this wasn't a concern. I was curious, uh, why did you, or like, did your client want to analyze the screenshots rather than the actual, like, page where you have, like, a lot of more structured semantic information? Yeah. So that's a very good question. We had the same doubt. Um, apparently they tried to scrape the website, but they were um, they defended the different changes they are all the time. So it made it very painful for them and they were just interested in a interested in a cool canal application, so they came up with this. There may be better ways, uh, faster ways. Uh, but that's for all this better in their business idea. They're meeting the product has with with more features and so on. So Thank you so much, Thank you.